It is starting. All right, uh, Friday rolls around. Uh, patients are ending. Uh, it's the weekend. We're in St. Louis. We're actually going to have good weather. Uh, it's been uh, hot, then rainy, then hot, then rainy. Um, but we're really excited for this round of research. And I think that um, it's really fun in what we do and looking at the research because we have so many people that give us information. And we're going to take all that information on a monthly basis, boil it down to what's going to affect your practice, my practice. Um, and he's halfway in practice on the way of retiring. Um, but we're going to make sure that we give you the tidbits of information and then we'll post this. Uh, so you'll be able to see all the actual full uh, articles and abstracts to make sure that you know exactly where all this information is coming from and we try to leave our opinions out of this uh, and turn it into just more just uh, the information and, and put it in, in ways that hopefully can affect you and your practice. Uh, but the first paper that I want to cover is in chiropractic manual therapy and I thought this was a really probably the favorite article of my uh, you know research over the, the, the month was looking at the highlights of chiropractic and there are over a hundred thousand chiropractors in the world and 48 institutions are now teaching chiropractic and that's in 19 countries I was talking with Richard Brown from the World Federation of Chiropractic and he said Malaysia is actually one of the fastest growing areas of chiropractic so it's not just us we're growing everywhere patient satisfaction uh, due to the, uh, the perception of the profession is uh, just getting better Better as the years go on. Yeah, there's no shortage of pain, especially lower back pain. That uh, study came out that, that told us what we already know, that the biopsychosocial component of managing this is so important. And they looked at all the things that we can tell our patient as far as how to improve their attitude, how to change their thought process about pain. Patients who have those yellow flags are not going to respond as quickly. So the two yellow flags that we want to address is number one, remain active. And number two, reassure the patient that back pain is a normal experience. There's not something wrong that's, that's happened in your body. There's something, a pain signal is going off because something is, is not functioning the way that it should be. So we can change that. You're not going to die from it. One of the tools that we make uh, available to you, and we'll link to this, this uh, post as well, are the key insights for managing low back pain. Subscribers can find this underneath their clinical forms, patient handouts along with dozens of other handouts, but a great way to, to send all of those messages that came out in this study to the patient including the two most important ones. And most of the time we see patients are back pain, you know, realistically as far as chiropractic, that's what we are uh, seen as. And a great paper came out in Journal of Medical Science of Pakistan. They looked at those disc herniations that we see so frequently. And as it turns out from a paper, I think a year ago is size matters. Uh, whether we want to believe it or not, it does. Um, and that size of disc herniation matters uh, when it comes to actually regression of that actual uh, disc problem. 10% of disc herniations don't regress. The good news is, is 75% do regress and they do have resolution of symptoms. Uh, so that's a good thing that, not that we have to wait things out, but we can keep people comfortable as that is going through a natural process. And the size plays into that in that the larger the disc mm -hmm. herniation, the greater inflammatory reaction, the quicker it goes away. So if your patient has a huge disc herniation, they're actually going to recover quicker than those ones with small bulges that just continue to cause inflammation over a prolonged period of time. The, um, <laughs> the, one, the one thing that I found interesting here, the number one cause of knee pain is patellofemoral pain syndrome. And this study came out, Journal of Strength and Condi Conditioning Research, that said women with patellofemoral pain syndrome had 36% lower knee extensor strength and significantly less stability. They also had 33% lower hip abduction strength with dramatically less hip stability, and that's really not a surprise. When those two things go away, our knee is controlled by what's happening at our foot and our hip. So those patients are ones who are going to start the rehab at, at the hip rather than at the knee itself. I'm going to jump ahead a couple pages, um, but I just want to go back to that disc herniation because that was a good point that you made about the size of the disc herniation having such a big deal. And, and that, that a couple uh, uh, papers ahead um, was interesting. It was in pain medicine, and they looked at epidural steroid injections because obviously a lot of our patients are going to be having those. Um, and who responds better to injections? Is it our disc patients or our heart tissue patients, like an arthritis patient? And what they found is that patients who have disc problems creating uh, radiculitis responded very well to injections, whereas those who were having degenerative changes to the actual joint did not have the same response. So if it's a heart tissue causing the problem, not as good of a, a response to a chemical solution, which we would expect. Excellent. Uh, other, other side of the body, if we're talking about uh, migraines, there was a study that said patients who have vitamin D deficiencies have significantly more, no, greater number of migraine attacks. 
and then a second paper that said what's the optimal dose for vitamin D and it turns into 1,000 to 4,000 international units. This information will actually be in our blog. We're going to take uh, 10 studies, many of which we're not covering here, but in the blog this Sunday uh, we'll cover that, that dose as well as nine other studies that, that we won't be hitting today. And that's the hard part is that when we take a look at all these blogs and Facebook Lives, there's going to be a lot of information coming at you. But the purpose is not to necessarily learn as much from that as to actually get to that resource. Taking research is easy. Reading research is easy. Incorporating that into practice is often a little more difficult. This great paper in Orthopedic Reviews talks about cubital tunnel syndrome. That's where we're going to have our numbness and tingling sending into our fourth and fifth fingers uh, due to, we'll call it spot welds, but due to some kind of irritation, compression um, at the elbow. Uh, and this says that, you know what, activity modification um, and also uh, conservative measures will help. So one thing that I do with my patients when I do get those symptoms is don't let them bend their elbow as much, especially when they're sleeping they keep their elbow here. My runners who keep their elbows tight to them uh, as they run can uh, develop cubital tunnel syndrome finding activity modification will significantly help those nerve symptoms because you're not going to be tethering that nerve across in this case the bone at the elbow you know it's funny you were talking about your presentation coming up at the FTCA and, and we were talking about uh, what you're going to discuss and what are the challenges that we as chiropractors face and it was really the three challenges were income incomes outcomes and recognition just the appreciation by the public of what we can accomplish outcome wise and so anytime that we have some big name that, that gives us recognition, we want to make sure people know about that. Vikings cornerback uh, Captain Munnerlyn uh, commented to USA Today. This is his exact quote. It was crazy. I'd never had it done before, but it got me back on the field in a week. Didn't use nothing, no machine, all hands. Wow, was this the son of God. So this is, this is something that came from an NFL player who has resources to everything and found great relief through a chiropractor. This is something that needs to be on your social media post for your patients to see. If it's something that you would like to uh, have automated and do on a, a daily basis, there is a product called Cairo Social Media. It's one of our sister companies, and Cairo Social Media will put these kind of things on your Facebook page each day. So you can check it out, or you can call Becky next door. Wow, this is the son of God. That's actually his license plate. Um, he put that on there a couple a couple of years ago. Uh, speaking of sports, though, this is one of the papers. I know we're doing uh, uh, medial elbow pain uh, that we have for uh, currently in Cairo, but we're working on some more uh, uh, as far as um, uh, uh, protocols when it comes to pitching, and especially in our adolescence pitching. Uh, we were doing this research, and I found this to be extremely interesting because as an athlete growing up, I always heard that if you threw a curveball when you were young, that you would actually have more elbow problems. And it turns out that's not the case. Uh, Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics looked at uh, pitching type and they found that it really doesn't matter what kind of pitch you do throw. It's actually the repetition of pitching and then most importantly, the rest time in between. So using it's not the worst thing, but giving people the adequate rest is, is the, the biggest part of that process. Um, also, when you look at, um, uh, this kind of uh, you know therapies, all the conservative measures that we do, uh, spinal manipulation has really been in the research. God, it's been everywhere. I mean, maybe we're doing more of it, but I feel like I'm getting more and more research papers that talk about spinal manipulation, and not only talk about spinal manipulation, but also say, hey, this is a great idea. Conservative measures, maybe it's the opioid crisis. Um, but when you look at the American College of Physicians papers and their guidelines, it is uh, it is, is documented and appropriate to prescribe spinal manipulation for a lot of conditions, including back pain. But we're not seeing that as far as the insurance companies. Um, so especially when you're working with any kind of a, an HR person in your in your patient population, talk to them about including chiropractic in their in their plans for their employees because that's how we're going to not only improve the perception of chiropractic in our own little community but we're going to change the landscape of healthcare in the u.s excellent point the um, study came out on fai patients so fai basically means that instead of having a ball and socket at your hip now one of those is egg shaped or both of them is egg shaped and so that doesn't work out so well this was initially identified in 1991, so back when I was in school, we didn't even know what it was. But now FAI is something that we see on our radiology reports on a regular basis. And initially, we thought that this was a surgical problem, that it was something that could only be solved since it was structural by a structural uh, solution. As it turns out, that's not the case because most of the time, those structural changes have been there a long time. We see so many issues with disc lesions don't matter and uh, degeneration and stenosis and menisci and slap lesions. These structural things that we find aren't the cause of the pain and the same is true of FAI, it's no different. 
In fact, this study that said that if you delay surgical intervention for up to 12 months, there is no long-term uh, effect on the outcome, so these patients do just as well. Now, if you continue to treat that patient and haven't had results beyond 12 months, now we're gonna start to see some degenerative changes. So we have a little bit longer leash on our FAI patients because there's generally a, a bigger issue there. I like the leash comment because the leash really does mm -hmm. matter. If you have progressive neurologic deficit, those patients are on a very short leash. Uh, someone who has FAI where it's more of a structural problem, they've got a little bit longer of a lead time where it gives you a chance to, uh, to do what you do best and hopefully help, help them, uh, but know that you're not creating any kind of long-term deficits. Uh, that leads into this next paper really well. Uh, and this next paper in, in the physio, Journal of Physiotherapy uh, talked about reoccurring back pain, and I think this is probably uh, what separates um, our profession. And it talked about there are three things that happen um, that happen in back pain, and two thirds of patients that go through any kind of treatment have an issue, and that issue is that it comes back. Um, it doesn't go away. We're treating them for their same diagnosis over and over again, and they find that if they keep on having their awkward posture, they keep on sitting for a long period of time, that they're going to have continuation of pain. And this is what separates uh, some chiropractors from other chiropractors, is sometimes we see patients over and over and over again for the same diagnosis. If you're seeing someone more than two to three times for the same diagnosis, and your recipe hasn't changed, you're doing your patient a disservice. So instead, you really have to change their posture, change their habits, and change what you're doing to the patient. Be a little creative, and when you can do that, then hopefully you can prevent that, uh, that next episode of that same diagnosis. Excellent. So Caleb says, can't wait to hear more on the shoulder and the upper extremity oh, in a yeah. few weeks from North Dakota. So Caleb, you are in for a treat. Uh, I've listened to Dr. Shoulder, Dr. Steele's lecture on the shoulder, and it's kind of like a Lawrence Welk show. So you might want to bring some extra reading material, but otherwise you, you'll probably, probably get something from it. So the funny part about that is I don't even know who Lawrence Welk is. And he made a <laughs> comment about um, you know, this FAI in uh, 1991. I was in third grade at that time. Yeah. Well, you'll come along at some point. In time. <laughs> so one thing that we do know is that uh, Dr. Steele does a great job on those classes, and you are, you are going to be pleased with that one. I, I don't think that there's a, a stronger shoulder presentation out there. Um, one of the things that uh, we had come up with a week or two ago was Dr. Steele also did a spinal mobilization with movement, uh, patients with sciatica. So we did a video. There was a study that came out, Archives of Medicine and Phys Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, that said if we add spinal mobilization and movement together, our sciatica patients improve. We're not gonna demonstrate that now, but you can check that out. It's on our probably our third last blog, so chiroup.com. Go to the blogs and you can check those out. Those are free to you every week as well. Speaking of people in back pain and leg pain, firemen. So this is a paper in Ergonomics 2019. And they look at firemen and the way they lift and the amount of force they put through their spine and what they found is that, you know, obviously body uh, mass and figure and that kind of stuff have an issue associated with spine loads. However, the way they lift, just the way they squat and lift and pick up things can dramatically affect spine compression. In fact, up to 5.5 times their body weight difference depending on how they lift. Um, so especially when patients come in and they say, listen, I've got to do my job, I've got to work, I've got to make money, I understand that. However, change the way they're working, change the way they're sitting or standing, or in this case, lifting, uh, because that may be the difference between getting them in or out of pain. Yeah, well, what a difference. Uh, huge difference here. Right now, one of the most exciting things that our profession is on the brink of is hopefully expanded reimbursement from Medicare. So House Bill 6345, I believe is what it is. Uh, one, something along those lines. But anyway, the ACA has sponsored the bill Right now, uh, all of the ACA reps are out talking to their congressmen about this bill. This is something that will change our lives as far as defining us as physicians in the Medicare system, as well as expanding what we're reimbursed for. So whatever we are licensed to perform in our state, if it's a Medicare covered service, now we get reimbursed and that certainly would change our incomes. One of the three problems we talked about earlier. A study came out just recently that reinforced why we should be part of that, not because we want to, but because we are cost effective. A study of, of almost uh, 90,000 older adults looked at healthcare related spending for lower back pain. Patients who were exposed to high levels of chiropractic accessibility, meaning their plan covered it, had half the uh, healthcare spending when it came to assessment and management of that condition. 
that would be a huge savings for our for our whole healthcare system and one of the real strong reasons why you and I need to be part of that system as healthcare continues to progress. Uh, back to exercise and uh, a big facet of what a lot of us do are exercises. Uh, Journal of Physical Therapy and Science looked at exercise and said, you know, what's good, what's bad, uh, what should we be doing? And they looked at McKenzie and looked at stabilization exercise and said that was actually better than just randomly prescribing exercise like a back school or Pilates. Um, however, when I looked, took a look at that literature review of those uh, randomized control studies, um, I think the biggest difference is classification. It's not necessarily the exercise, mm -hmm. it's classifying which person should be doing which exercises. Now, uh, somebody with stenosis, chances are, you know, if you classify them appropriately, chances are they're probably not an extension bias person. So don't give the same exercise to every single person, making sure you look at their orthopedic considerations before making that differentiation. Two uh, quick studies that were interesting. Most lumbar disc problems happen at either L4-5 or L5-S1, 90%. But that means that 10% don't. So number one thing is that if a patient has a radiculopathy that's coming from a lower lumbar disc, a straight leg raise is going to give us the answer. But if they're with that 10% that have a lumbar disc herniation above L4, we can't do a straight leg raise. We're going to do the femoral nerve stretch test, which is basically yeoman test. And so 10% of those patients have an upper lumbar disc herniation. And one thing that we can get a clue as to could it be an upper lumbar disc herniation is if they have a wedge-shaped vertebra. Patients who have a wedge-shaped vertebra in their lumbar spine have a much higher likelihood of having an upper lumbar disc herniation. And the other study is a no-brainer. That smartphone addiction increases the craniovertebral angle and increases scapular dyskinesis. Unfortunately, our young people now have postural trainers that they learn how to make their scapula dysfunctional and how to have weak, weak deep neck flexors leading to upper cross syndrome and perpetuating the things that you and I treat. Really, that's the reason why two-thirds of back pain patients are having recurrence is because the lower cross syndrome wasn't, wasn't addressed or in the case of neck pain, the upper cross wasn't addressed. Which leads great into the next one is journal shoulder and elbow surgery said that when you're treating these shoulder problems, uh, like scapular dyskinesis, uh, when you look at exercise, it actually does a really good job of decreasing pain and disability, but not necessarily as far as improving their posture. Um, so just pre uh, prescribing exercise does not affect their structure. Uh, it may in the long run. Um, however, short run, decreased pain, decreased disability, you still have to teach someone how to have better posture when they're performing those movements that you know, provoke pain. Yeah, and, and one of those movements that provokes pain is when they're running. Right now it's going to turn into a great time to get outside and get running. Summer's over, so we're going to see more injuries from the lower chain. Athletes are getting onto the fields, onto football fields, basketball will be starting up in the next few months, and your runner running population is going to increase. So there was a study that looked at three cues that we can give our patients to decrease the stress on the lower chain. Cue number one is changing them from a traditional heel strike to more of a ball of the foot strike. Number two was to increase the cadence. Rather than taking a long stride, they're going to take a short, quick stride. So their cadence is going to increase to 180, 180 strikes per minute. That's a little bit of a change, but it also helps that patient to, to keep from going up, that we lose energy when we're not going forward. So anything that causes us to accelerate and decelerate, anything that takes energy to go in a vertical fashion, those are things that are going to bleed energy from us going in a horizontal fashion. So trying to decrease the stride length was helpful. And number three, to stand up taller, to imagine that you're being held up by a string and then leaning forward on the gas pedal at whatever speed. A sprinter is gonna lean forward dramatically to push on the pedal hard, whereas a jogger is gonna be standing more upright. When we can give the patient any one of those clues, the landing on the ball of the foot was the most important cue, and when we combined all three, it was more potent than any one of them in isolation. So if you wanna learn more about running mechanics, there's probably a 10 minute quick refresher in our blog about three blogs ago, so if you take a look at that, uh, we go through all the mechanics, the energy losses, and how patients can be more efficient and minimize their chance of injury. So check that out. And if you ever want to see that YouTube Phoebe from Friends Running, and you can see exactly how not to run, one of my favorite YouTube videos. <laughs> um, getting into uh, you know change in weather, uh, one of the biggest things that, that happens in weather change, it is a stress. Um, so an environmental uh, paper came out just this year talking about 
uh, relative humidity in migraines. And while that's an important paper, I think the more important point is that weather changes and changes in barometric pressure affects pain. Uh, as barometric pressure goes down, it affects arthritis. As it goes up, it actually affects conditions like BPPV. Uh, so be cognizant of any kind of increased stress. It's just another drip in the, the glass of the stress that, that are uh, imparted upon the body and people may be uh, having symptoms just because of those stresses and not necessarily something that we need to be um, as concerned about musculoskeletally. And it's interesting that those stressors are unique per condition, right? The barometric pressure goes up or down and it depends on which condition we're talking about. And the same is true of treadmill running that if we are running on a treadmill, uh, our gastroc forces are significantly higher, but our rectus femoris and vastus uh, forces are significantly smaller. Whereas if we're running on flat ground, then we're going to, to have just the opposite. So if we're going to have a knee patient, especially an anterior knee pain patient, it may be better to rehab that patient on the treadmill versus an Achilles tendinopathy patient, we're gonna be better re rehabbing them on a track. Uh, because they're going to have significantly less force. So it depends on the condition as to the same same type of stressor. So I've got a string here of conditions and, and some treatments that I think might fit well into that. Uh, this was in best practices and, and mostly rheumatology, but looking at uh, who's best treated with what kind of, of treatments. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing, especially as a clinical diagnosis, would be tendinopathies. And we used to think of tendinopathies as rest, relax, tendinitis, but as it turns out, these are mostly tendinosis uh, diagnosis, and they need to be rough up, uh, making sure that we can actually just go into a progressive loading process, especially in their rehab. Uh, conditions like uh, plantar fasciosis or conditions like a, um, a patella tendinosis, those are things that we can progressively load and hopefully uh, increase uh, a little increase in, in discomfort, hopefully not nighttime pain. If they're having nighttime pain, we might have done a little bit too much and inflamed that tissue. We want to make sure we keep it calmed down. We want to start to load that and build the capacity in that tissue. Uh, and that's probably why uh, BMC just put out a paper just this, uh, I think two months ago, that said when we have these kind of conditions and you inject with a chemical like a corticosteroid, in that case it was for um, uh, plantar fasciitis, it doesn't help because it's not a chemical problem. It's a mechanical problem. You have to make sure you're providing a mechanical solution to a mechanical problem. The same thing happens when we look at, this was the Journal of Orthopedic uh, Surgery, uh, also in uh, just last month, and they looked at what should we do in the patients with problems that are amendable uh, to mechanical solutions. And what they found is that ultrasound, yeah, that's okay. Maybe in 1991, that was a good option, uh, but not now. Things like extracorporeal shockwave therapy, things that are gonna stimulate a healing response might be a little more effective. Yeah, we want to we want to initiate controlled inflammation as opposed to suppress it. The um, study, great study that came out that you'll want to share with your legal community that moderate facet degeneration is associated with non-recovery and whiplash patients. That those who had a moderate degree of degeneration had 70% non-recovery at six months compared with only 23% non-recovery if they don't have facet degeneration. Now that same relationship wasn't there for disc degeneration, so the facets played a bigger role. And their conclusion that whiplash trauma is a trigger for ongoing pain that otherwise would have been asymptomatic. So this is a study, and this was done Spine Journal, uh, August of 2019, that this would be a great thing to print out the abstract and give to your legal community to let them know that you have something to offer those patients. So here's the difference. You know, the difference is here's what, 23 pages, I think I printed out, 23 pages of research that came out and most of those are August. So we're talking one month, not even a month. We're taking research and we're gonna hopefully bring that to you and that's great if for people who watch the Facebook Live, but we'll include this as far as the, the link. And the cool part about that, this is already being implemented in Cairo, that the exercise, the patient education, the infographics, uh, handouts, all that is going to be done and included in Cairo for you to use. So it's not necessarily just looking at evidence and being an evidence-based provider. It's looking at the evidence and deciding what you want to use for your patients and making it accessible, making it good and, and, and uh, you know, well done professional pieces of information, whether it's patient information or handouts, uh, and turning it into your normal practice. Uh, so consider taking a look at the handouts, consider taking a look at the information that we've presented, and then take a look at what's in Cairo and making sure that what you're doing in practice uh, is realistic and is, is amendable with uh, the current changes in science. That's a great point, that it's, it's really nothing that I can do myself, you can do yourself. There's really a team, there's three DCs who harvest research, there's a whole group of other people who edit that research, people who put it into the protocols, and so there's no way that we could harvest that on our own in an individual practitioner, but now I know because the team is working, 
Uh, my patients, as of this morning, are now getting recommendations on uh, vitamin D to, to uh, if they're a migraine patient. They're getting uh, recommendations on the most appropriate exercises, the cautions on running outdoor versus on treadmill if they're Achilles versus a, a, a knee problem. And those things are just tough to keep up on on your own, so I'm, I'm proud to be part of that team. Most importantly, I'm proud to be part of your team. I hope that you'll, uh, you'll continue to give us feedback on what we can do better, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for watching.